there's a fresh chapter in the seemingly never-ending battle between Pakistan's political establishment and former Prime Minister Imran Khan. Meanwhile, towards the east, the US in a first has commissioned a warship in Australia. And we're all used to consultants having a say in every field of life. But what really is their impact? We'll be looking at these stories in great detail in this episode of Daily Debrief. Keep watching. Pakistan's Election Commission issued a non-bailable warrant against former Prime Minister Imran Khan on Monday. This is because he failed to appear before the commission which had summoned him for certain remarks he made against the body. Following this, Imran Khan did appear before the Election Commission on Tuesday and the body said that it had suspended its indictment of the former Prime Minister till August 12th. Imran and the Pakistani establishment have been on an all-out legal war over the past many months. He faces some 150 cases. His arrest in May had led to massive protests and intervention by the Supreme Court. To understand the latest chapter in this legal battle, we go to Abdul. Abdul, so, uh, I mean, we have actually, in some senses, it feels like we are repeating ourselves a bit here because we have done this story twice or thrice. There is a case filed against Imran Khan. The Pakistani state making all kinds of attempts to arrest him. Uh, then it kind of then there is there's some kind of a stalemate. So uh, could you give us first a little more detail about what this case is about? Well, it seems that last year, while of course Imran Khan has been angry, quote unquote, against the establishment in Pakistan ever since he was uh, kind of uh, removed from power after the vote of confidence in parliament and uh, has been basically uttering uh, different kinds of allegations of different state institutions uh, and in election commission is no uh, exception. So, of course, he said something which uh, uh, was considered to be insulting and challenging the legitimacy of the election commission of Pakistan and a case was filed regarding it uh, in last October. Uh, and that case was, of course, uh, has become much more important now, because elections are coming, uh, Pakistan is already discussing about an interim government, a caretaker government, which will basically see through the elections. And in this particular context, when Imran Khan is already facing different other uh, cases, this is also uh, brought up. Uh, uh, just to remind, just to kind of uh, make it clear that this is not the only case which is going on uh, at this moment. There, the, he, Imran Khan is already on bail on the Tosha Khana case, and there is a, a case related to the uh, the murder of a lawyer in Baluchistan, which is which is also suspended uh, till postponed till August 9. So these three cases are at this moment uh, in in the main uh, are prominent, but there are, as you rightly pointed out, there are hundreds of other cases which are there. So uh, it seems that. Uh, uh, there is a speculation in Pakistan going on that there is an attempt by the state authorities uh, or, and election commission also, which basically election commission becomes a part of it to somehow uh, kind of keep Imran Khan engaged in uh, different kinds of cases here and there. Some, if possible, disqualify him. And election commission's case basically is the most uh, 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 prominent one, most uh, uh, has the most possibility that uh, he can be disqualified from contesting the election. So give, this should be uh, uh, seen in that particular context when there is an outright uh, uh, anti uh, Imran Khan, uh, uh, you can say, uh, moves taken by the ruling establishment in Pakistan. And this also uh, falls within that, uh, that particular scheme. Right, Abdul, in this context, important to ask if, you know, how is, what has been the popular sentiment at this point? Because we know that the government is facing a lot of crisis, deeply unpopular. It is not really, I mean, it, first of all, it is a coalition government of former rivals. And generally, a sense you get is that the government is pretty paralyzed in terms of not being able to do much. Whereas Imran Khan, like we have said, emerged, uh, especially after his uh, overthrow, as some kind of anti-system crusader kind of a thing. So how, what has been happening there? See, uh, if after he was arrested uh, in, uh, I think, June last month. In May, I think. Uh, May, yeah. So, uh, 
and then the violence which unleashed after that, the popular, uh, you can say, mobilization on the streets all across Pakistan. The Pakistani establishment, including the military, has come very heavily uh, on the supporters of uh, PTI. And uh, hundreds of people have been arrested. Uh, a large number of cases have been filed on different workers, uh, all kinds of workers in all provinces in Pakistan uh, of PTI workers. Uh, and uh, in fact, some of the prominent leaders of the PTI were also, it seems, forced. It was, of course, there is no evidence to prove it. But uh, the way it happened, that the, they were forced to kind of uh, break their links with uh, the, the party itself. They publicly announced after uh, that. And there, a, a large number of these cases are filed uh, and, built, uh, and are tried in the military courts. So despite all these things that have a large number of, you can say, uh, operation uh, is going on against the workers of the PTI, that is one. The second thing is, uh, as you rightly pointed out, the the uh, current coalition government itself is not, uh, uh, there is no kind of uh, common ground between the PPP and the PMLN, uh, these two prominent parties which are running the coalition government. In fact, uh, there is already a debate going on who will be the caretaker prime minister and PMLN is basically insisting of having someone from his, their own uh, group to run the, uh, the interim government which will see through the elections. And that is not acceptable by the PPP. So after the repression uh, uh, and also given the differences within the ruling establishment, given the fact that the post IMF deal, there has been a, a massive cut uh, in subsidies in different areas. It, it is quite obvious that there, on, there is a popular unrest. There is a popular uh, disagreement or you can say dissent to whatever is happening. But if you want to uh, see it, whether it is uh, uh, kind of converting into the large scale popular mobilization ad happen in May, uh, nothing of that sort is visible. Uh, 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 people in Pakistan are also uh, basically facing a large scale, uh, again, a sec another round of floods uh, and uh, economic crisis. So it seems that on the, and at this moment, there is no popular uh, uh, mobilization on the streets. But it, given the, uh, the polls which we had before, given the elections, given the record which we already have, the evidences which we already have for last uh, couple of months, it seems that none of these moves are taken. Uh, uh, not, none of these moves are acceptable by the uh, masses in Pakistan. And though we are not in a position to say what will happen in the future, but we should wait and see what happens if the elections really happen. If, if can, one of the prominent newspapers in Pakistan, Dawn, today wrote an editorial, given all these uh, circumstances, that in this condition, even the possibility of a free and fair election in Pakistan is not possible. So we do not know uh, what ex exactly the public uh, mood is, but we can sense uh, 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 on the basis of the previous record that this is, of course, not acceptable uh, uh, by the people's, people in Pakistan. Well, thank you so much. Uh, like you said, Pakistan, very crucial months coming ahead for Pakistan. And I believe today Bilawal Bhutto, the foreign ministers, met Antony Blinken, of course. So we don't know what that brings. The US has always been a key player in Pakistan. But thanks so much. We'll come back to you for future analysis of this country. Now, in our next story, we've all heard the names of big consultancy firms such as Pricewaterhouse Coopers, that's PwC or Deloitte. They make their appearance regularly in reports and studies. We often treat them as the ultimate authority on technical issues. But across the world, there's been a lot of criticism of how these consultancy firms have taken over what should be the work of governments. And they're not even that efficient and cost a ton of money. Now, recently, there have been a lot of discussions on this, especially in the health sector, after these firms took over a lot of the response of governments when it came to COVID-19. We have with us Anna Rachara, the People's Health Movement, to talk more about this. Anna, this is a topic which I think there's been a lot of debate on in recent times. Like I said, uh, across the world, the hand of consultancy firms is really very visible. So could you maybe take us through what are some of what is the scope, first of all, of how these organizations function? What kind of responsibilities have they taken over? 
Well, you know, in, in practical terms, what they have ta- uh, they what they have taken up to themselves is essentially to tell governments what they should do to advise them, what kind of steps they should take uh, in the different uh, uh, fields of policy. And of course, you know, um, uh, recently there have been some articles about the role that they play in the in the realm of uh, health policy. Uh, not only co- uh, concerning COVID-19, but mo- uh, most recently researchers in Australia have raised concerns about, you know, how the same consultancy firms uh, are at the same time working on national strategies uh, for uh, for climate justice, uh, while at, on the other hand, uh, consulting fossil fuel uh, fossil fuel industries. So it, uh, it kind of uh, brings in, into perspective this kind of... Um, conflict of interest that the presence of uh, consultancy firms uh, seems to be uh, in- intrinsic to. Uh, essentially, what they're doing is at the one, on the one side, uh, they're telling governments uh, what steps they should take in order to achieve climate justice, while uh, on the other hand, they're also, uh, you know, uh, trying to, uh, to secure more profits for the fossil fuel industry. Um, and of course, this I, I think that this doesn't even have to be said. Uh, is that uh, we uh, we come up with uh, uh, very serious questions about who they are prioritizing at that moment. So you know, uh, who's paying most? Uh, who, uh, who is that uh, like their uh, first accountability to? And I think that from what we have seen uh, from the results uh, coming out of the the consultancy uh, actions done by by these firms over uh, over history is that essentially it's not the public interest. So it's not in their interest to actually advocate uh, and to propose uh, health policies or climate policies or tax policies which put uh, put the interest of the people ahead of the interest of uh, of the private companies that they work very closely to. Right, and, right, and in this context, context, of course, I think, I think researchers research. have pointed out, including uh, the economist Mariana Mazzucato in her recent book, that one side effect of consultants playing such a huge role is the fact that governments lose capacity to execute many of these policies. And I think that maybe health is one of those sectors where it is most crucial because on the one hand, you have governments cutting costs, you know, and on the other hand, you have, say, these firms taking over a lot of even what should be operational functions. Absolutely. So I think, you know, uh, in health, uh, we have um, this problem uh, presents itself in multifold ways. So, you know, on the one hand, uh, we know that uh, because of austerity cuts, because of the line that has been promoted uh, in health policy uh, over the past decades, uh, we have lost a lot of competent people who actually knew their way around uh, health policy and who were ready uh, to point out the ways in uh, in which health policy contributes to the rest of society uh, and essentially secures the right to health for, for most people. Uh, these people are now largely gone. Uh, and uh, what the uh, what the consultancy firms are doing instead is that uh, they continue along the same lines. They propose more cuts. They propose more, uh, you know, um, more health workers to be laid off, and so on and so on. Uh, it's essentially a very technocratic procedure that they approach. Uh, it's a very technocratic vision of healthcare that they propose and that uh, they're not backing up from. Um, so, uh, and on the other hand, you know, it's um, this has, I would say, seriously contributed to the fact that uh, today uh, health is perceived in this very, um, it's it perceived as something very complex, as something that cannot be explained, as something that um, uh, should be left only to the highest ranking health officials uh, or to the or to the managers who have proper training for that. When essentially in practice, we know that this is very much not so. Uh, we know that uh, when the people uh, get the right and get uh, get the chance to uh, to shape the health policies that uh, they find they need, that essentially we have a health system which is more equitable. It's more fair. And uh, if I may add, it costs much less than the health system that the consultancy firms are pushing on us. Right, absolutely. It's interesting because I think we've written about this on People's uh, Health Dispatch and People's Dispatch, you've written about it. Because a lot of the work the People's Health Movement does seems to be to mobilize community opinion, to educate them, but also to ensure their participation in how health policies are framed, which seems a very different approach from what consultancies do. Absolutely, yes. And I think that, you know, this kind of approach where um, 
we actually succeed to bring the people in uh, the process of uh, shaping their own policies, uh, we have seen uh, go things going in a completely different direction than what we're seeing in the in the mainstream in the corporate sector. So essentially, people have risen up to uh, you know reclaim the health institutions that have been privatized. Uh, there has been um, a quite uh, okay. The, it has been quite a modest wave, but yet a wave of deprivatization and reclaiming uh, of uh, of health around the world. Um, so from from Asia to uh, over Europe to other to other regions, uh, and I think this really shows that uh, you know uh, people people know what the health system should be there for. Uh, and I think that it also it also shows that the people are ready to to fight for it. Now the question remains whether the government will actually uh, hear what the people uh, uh, want from to see from their health system, uh, or if they will continue to rely on this kind of um, outside um, outsourced advice that they're receiving currently. Right. Thank you, Anna, once again for bringing a political perspective into the question of health, which is what we do here. And I would say that next time we hear one of the big consultancy firms and their reports, we should probably really take a step back and think what, of, what is really the agenda here. Thank you so much. And finally, we go to Australia once again, where the US Navy commissioned a warship in the port of Sydney. Now, this is the first time a US ship has joined service at a foreign port. The Australian Defence Minister said that the commissioning was reflective of the fact that the two countries shared joint values and joint commitment to upholding the rules-based order. Now, viewers of this show would recognize this phrase, rules-based order. It's a code for how the US wishes to organize the world. This happens in every sector. And Australia has been in the forefront of implementing the US strategy in the Asia-Pacific region. We go to our East Asia analyst, Anish, for more on this. Anish, so uh, a growing partnership to be to put it very, to, it was a bit of an understatement maybe, because we have seen a lot happening over the past few years. So could you, how do you sort of see this uh, commissioning a warship in this process? Yes, for example, so the commissioning of the uh, naval ship is quite significant in the sense that it only, as you pointed out, marks, and as they say, it marks the a sort of friend, uh, military, closer military relationship uh, with Australia, and which is something that has continued uh, from the conservative uh, national liberal coalition to now under the Labour Party. But uh, on the other hand, we also need to look at it as a larger strategy uh, of the Indo-Pacific and the Indo by, and by Indo-Pacific, it pretty much is code word for China and uh, encirclement of China. And we've spoken about this quite a bit uh, in the show. But I think it needs to be emphasized because every time uh, there is uh, some similar commissioning, some war games, some military drills happening in the region, it has some level of implicit, uh, uh, you know, language. Uh, as you pointed out, even the rules-based order that they speak about, uh, very interesting considering the fact that they do not have, uh, they are not party to a lot of conventions of this. Uh, of the sea, of uh, several conventions of trade, even health. And on these matters, the US is pretty much the outlier when compared to China, which is party to most major uh, treaties and agreements and customary law. But US refuses to be part of that. And then it uh, has the audacity to actually say that it wants to implement a rules-based order in a region where it has no physical or you know territorial stake at even. So that is, uh, this is like part of this whole, uh, you know, very ongoing and, you know, quite uh, long developing uh, um, strategy of trying to encircle China with a certain, you know, by bringing up and shoring up forces in the region. Right, Anish, of course, uh, there's also been, I believe, some amount of opposition in civil society, protests of various kind against this. So what are the protesters saying and what kind, what are their demands? Yeah, so the protests have always been quite significant because uh, even despite the fact that the Labour government right now is pretty much pushing, uh, you know, this policy of, you know, uh, shoring up uh, support for uh, U.S. military designs in the region, uh, uh, it's many of its constituents are not really that keen. You have had trade unions, talk, uh, you know, organizing rallies against the AUK-US, which is another a major significant part of this uh, China encirclement policy. And uh, obviously there have been recent protests, uh, especially against the Tasmanian uh, war games that happened recently, which is a multilateral effort. But even then uh, the fact that something 
it's so massive, about 30,000 troops from all over the world, most of them obviously the United States, uh, participating in a, a set of war games uh, that that is pretty much designed for invasion and stuff like that. So there is uh, obviously, again, uh, the fact that such things are happening and the U.S. has free hand on mo most of these uh, matters and pretty much overrides even Australian national interest in many ways. We've seen the AUK's submarine deal, which actually uh, affected Australia the worst and gave it the, uh, the short end of everything, pretty much, uh, in, in, even increasing the earlier uh, deals that it had for submarines uh, with France uh, and, you know, uh, surging prices in uh, a significant way at a time when austerity was ruling uh, the rooster in uh, Australia. So this pretty much, all of these factors uh, pretty much affect everybody. And the fact that Australians, a large number of Australian progressives are calling that out. They want a government to uh, focus on uh, welfare, on uh, the cost of living crisis that is also significant, that is still you know ongoing. And uh, and the fact that a lot of uh, trade unions and workers' rights are being un also uh, continues to be undermined by several state governments. It wants the Labour government to focus on that rather than help the U.S. to militarize the region even further. Something that even a small country like New Zealand does not really uh, want to participate in, but some something like Australia, despite all the uh, claims of the Labour being uh, quite a neutral, taking a neutral position, is trying to uh, engage in quite significantly. Well, Anish, thank you so much for that. A uh, lot to watch out in that region. There's, uh, you know, multiple interests at play. We'll be tracking that in future episodes as well. And that's all we have time for in today's episode. This is, of course, the daily debrief that comes to you on People's Dispatch. Do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on all the social media platforms and keep watching and reading.